Hi there, it's Marla at Narrate. In this week's message, Adam continues the conversation on relationships and speaks to our quality of life being affected by the quality of our relationships. What if in every relationship there's bound to be times when gaps form between what we expect and what we experience? Will we fill those gaps in with trust or suspicion? Enjoy the message as we wrap up the Relationship Charades series. So, uh, this morning we want to finish up this series that we started several weeks ago called Relationship Charades. Uh, We've been trying to talk a lot about marriage, but I I, I sure hope that what you found is, whether you're married or dating or not, whether you're in middle school or not, like whatever your relational surroundings are, that there's some stuff that you've pulled from all of this to apply to relationships. I know I, for one, am perpetually reminded that I could always use more tools because I'm terrible at the whole concept of relationships. So hopefully there's been some tools that you can apply across the board in your life, whether it's as a leader or as a spouse or as a friend or a teammate or whatever that looks like. This morning, I'd like to think that that is especially true because this morning we're going to talk about a value that, that frankly, we've, we've touched on before. I think it's one of those things that we purposely return to periodically Uh, But that doesn't make it any easier. In fact, I'm reminded that it's one of the more difficult things I think we can do in relationships. What I want to mess around with this morning is this idea that what what if if there's a, a decision that you make several times every day, and yet you're pretty unaware that you make the decision, and yet the way you make the decision impacts the quality of your life? Now, I know that's like... Next up, we're going to talk, I mean, that's like kind of a really big claim, right? But, but seriously, what, what, what if, and, and this could be said of a lot of decisions we make, but what if there's a particular uh, type of decision that we make in relationship every day, and it has huge impact? I, I had a friend that said to me years and years and years ago, Adam, the quality of your life will always be determined by the quality of your relationships. And to whatever degree that's true, I, I think this morning's question is, is among the very most important things, and it deals with this. What if the, this, this thing called relationship is a series of experiences where, where, we, where, where what we expect someone to do and what we actually experience creates a gap? And what if how we fill in that gap determines much about how we experience marriage, friendship, coaching relationship, work relationship, whatever kind of relationship we want to talk about. Now, part of where I want to dive in from this is in, is, is in a letter that Paul wrote uh, that we know as 1 Corinthians, because we weren't always creative when we titled books. He wrote it to a place called Corinth. We think he probably, we're all but certain, he wrote three letters. We, we have still have hold of two of them. But I want to talk a little bit about the historical context of Corinth, because uh, my own personal passion for understanding historical context is only growing, and I think in this case it's very important because Corinth isn't isn't a term that necessarily, it's not a city that comes to mind when you think of the Mediterranean world, but it certainly would have been in Paul's day. Uh, We we think of Rome, we think of Athens, but but what's what's often lost is that Corinth in Paul, in Jesus, in the first century uh, world of the Bible, in their day, Corinth was a very prominent city. The the cultural values, or at least the the cultural creation it brought to the table, its impact on religion was every bit as big as Rome. In in fact, in some context, it was talked about as a rival to Rome, or like, like, like the 1B to Rome being 1A. Now, Paul's writing this letter to Corinth, and part of what's important to remember is that means he's not writing to Jewish people. He's not writing to people whose general concepts of God have been formed by uh, the, the, the Old Testament or the Tanakh or the Jewish understanding of God. Their experience of the gods was driven by Greco-Roman views of gods. And again, we, we've talked a lot about this over the last year or so, but it's vital that we bear in mind that that means that their understanding of the gods were that the gods didn't like people. Guys didn't care about people. Sometimes they mated with people. Sometimes they manipulated people. But the whole game wasn't that gods cared for people. That's where you come, uh, that's where this idea of sacrifice comes in. The idea was you, you sacrifice things you value to God in order to somehow appeal to her or him or them and in hoping, therefore, what crops you didn't sacrifice, what children you didn't sacrifice, what, that somehow they would grow, that you'd win some battles. It, it was, here's another way to say it. Uh, religion in, in, the, in the Greek world was almost entirely a vertical experience. There, there was no human-to-human morality in the way that you thought about religion. We would all take for granted that it would be a sheer contradiction and hypocritical to say you had a really good relationship with God, but you treated people like garbage. That wouldn't have been a problem in the world of Corinth. 
Their experience of God was entirely vertical. You do things for God. It had nothing moral or almost nothing horizontal going on. And so when Paul is writing these letters, especially letters like Corinth, a major piece of what he's trying to do is help shape the way they think about God to the way Jesus taught about God, who Jesus was as God. And therefore, a huge piece of that was Paul going, you have to understand that for this Jesus, there's a very horizontal thing going on. This God We've not always caught it, he might say. The Jewish people didn't always understand this. But this God isn't impressed by the vertical so much as he is by the horizontal. This God finds our offerings and sacrifices repulsive if the horizontal isn't healthy. This God says the value of Sunday morning is to shape the value of our relationships the other six days. And so Paul is constantly driving that into their heads and at the very least helping them to understand that at his core, this God defines the win as how we treat those around us. Remember, this is a God who says in the very opening act of Scripture, you're image bearers. You rule in my stead, which makes us a little uncomfortable. We're going to talk, this is part of what we're going to jump into next week on on Easter Sunday and the Saturday before. Image bearers, it's, it's a God who says, you're in charge. I created you to rule in my stead, to function as though I would if I was you. And so Paul, within that context, towards the end of this letter, which is where his letters tend to get intensely practical, he he writes a passage that's probably familiar to you. You've invariably heard it at a wedding at least once. And what's important to know is he's not writing to newlyweds. That doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to newlyweds, but that's not the context. The context is a bunch of people who think that what God wants is for them to show up and make sacrifices. And Paul's going, that's not who this God is. That's not how this God rolls. And in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul jumps into, uh, here's this, what what I'm guessing will be a somewhat familiar passage. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. What Paul would have known was that in this day, uh, the the summer camp, if you will, of spiritual experience, like like the pinnacle, It, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a great worship concert. It wasn't a good Sunday morning. The pinnacle what were these kind of drunken orgy fests where if you arrived at this certain kind of esoteric place with God, you'd start speaking in what we would call Babel. They would say it was the language of the gods. And Paul's going, listen, listen, listen. Even if you have this phenomenal experience where you catch yourself speaking the language of the gods, it's all a waste of your time if you're not treating those around you appropriately. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. Another way to say that was, listen, even if I'm seen as the greatest spiritual giant that the world has ever seen, if that doesn't impact the way I treat people around me, it doesn't matter. Fred said to me years and years and years ago, this person who influenced me, said, Adam, I... It, you will find yourself faced with a scenario where you get to choose between being an A plus pastor and communicator and a C plus parent and husband, or a C plus pastor and communicator and an A plus parent and husband, and I sure hope you pick the latter. Now, that's not a way of in any way saying uh, I've accomplished that at all. But it is this reminder that we have to be careful because the things we celebrate and the things that get us praised are altogether different than what this God values. This God is over and over and over and over again going, you want to evaluate the the value of Sunday morning in your life? Does it drive the way you treat people? Does it inspire you to treat them better? If not, find something else to do is really what he's saying. Verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast and I do not have love, I gain nothing. So here he's appealing to the, I think effectively what he's saying is, listen, had Jesus died on the cross, and rose again, and treated people like crud along the way, it wouldn't have mattered. He's he's pushing against this value of self-sacrifice and going, even even self-giving love, which becomes difficult to fulfill if it's all about you, but it's still doable, isn't it? And then he gets into this list, and and what I'm driving at here is there's an aspect of what he gets into that I I find incredibly difficult. He says, love is patient, love is kind. We've talked about this. uh, Peter says, uh, love is humble, 
Uh, Paul says in, in a different letter, he says, uh, submit to one another. So it's this idea that love puts others before self. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love doesn't have to put other people down to bring yourself up. It's not a zero-sum game. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. I mean, nothing about this list is easy. That's not what he's claiming. In fact, part of what he's pointing to is this Jesus his calling's high. You'll need his spirit. Uh, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. And then if you've ever read this list, which you may or may not have, but there's a couple claims in here that for me is, is why I've never actually studied it. Because I'm always like, okay, I don't get it because that doesn't make any sense. And we're coming up on it. I want to deal with one this morning. It always, love always protects. It always trusts. Which is where I want to go like, time out. Always trusts. Like now we're pushing up against some of what we've talked about in the past about like boundaries and in fact, I, I subscribe, I've even taught uh, the idea that Cloud, Henry Cloud and um, John Townsend teach that, that it's important that we differentiate forgiveness from reconciliation, from trust, that, for, that forgiveness only takes me, that reconciliation takes two willing parties who want to mend a relationship, and trust is earned. Right behavior over time. Always trust? What do we do with that? Uh, here's a dare for you. Sit across f- from the spouse that's been cheated on for years, and say to that wife, say to that husband, well, I'll tell you what Jesus would do. He would trust, because love always trusts. Sit across from the boss who's dealing very honestly with underperformance or, or some kind of deception or stealing, and, and say, well, I'll tell you how Jesus would be a boss. He would always trust. Sit across to the victim of abuse and preach Paul here and, and see if that leads them to Jesus. It's troubling at best. So what, what in the world? And, and, and I think really where we're going to end this whole relationship series is an opportunity to kind of peel this back and, and begin to ask some questions about, wait, wait a minute, what, what does it look like for love to always trust? And here is where uh, a guy named Marcus Buckingham and, and some research he points to, uh, he, he wrote a book years and years ago called uh, The One Thing You Need to Know. If you're not familiar with Marcus Buckingham, uh, he, he seems to be a little more off the radar now, but a phenomenal leader and thinker. In this book, The One Thing You Need to Know, he talks about some research that was conducted um, years prior that was a 20-year longitudinal study, which is a way of saying it's nothing like a sermon from Adam where you have an idea and then you make claims about it. It's where you have an idea and then you spend 20 years testing your claim. And what he does, this longitudinal study, what it does is it follows couples from, from marriage through having been married for 20 plus years in order to ask this question, why 20 years later Are some couples sick of each other and they're only together because of the kids? And other couples 20 years later actually delight in one another's company as much as they did in year two. They wanted to to figure this out. And of course, uh, you can't exhaust all the potentials. But one of the things that they observed uh, was, was it came about by some questions they asked. Now, one of the things they would do is they would take couples periodically, presumably throughout the 20 years, especially on the other side of 20 years, and they would take them and they would ask them two, two, two uh, particular questions that are relevant to this morning. The one is, actually what they would do is they'd take the wife, and absent the husband's knowledge, they would have the wife rate the husband on how she rated him in things like virtue, morality, and likability. And then they would have the husband rank or rate himself. Then they would take the husband and they'd have him rate the wife on those issues, and then they'd have the wife rate herself. Now, what their, their hypothesis going into it was that I'll bet you, this is what they were thinking, I'll bet you what drives happy marriage is that over time, the, the husband lowers his expectations of the wife and vice versa. What they found was exactly the opposite. What they found when they started peeling back these layers and layers and years and years of research what was that when they took couples who appeared to be delightfully happy, who enjoyed one of their company, who, who 20 years later were still happy, what they found was that the, the wife rated her husband on things like virtue, morality, and likability higher than he rated himself. What they found was that the husband rated his wife on those issues, those very same issues, higher than she rated herself. They actually called this in their research the upward spiral of love which I know you could never say over dinner with some friends because they'd punch you in the nose, but the upward spiral of love. And and here's how how the upward spiral of love works. Watch this. What they observed is that the illusion leads to a conviction. That you become convinced they're better than they are actually leads to the conviction that they're better than they are. Uh, the, The conviction 
leads to security. So because you're so sure that they're so awesome, you somehow feel more safe in the relationship. That security leads to high trust. That high trust leads to intimacy. Uh, because intimacy, as we know, is it's this ruthless, like, dangerous reveal. That intimacy leads to more love, and that love leads to the illusion. Hence the self-perpetuating spiral. Second verse, same as the first. Maybe we should have done that as a preview song. Like, what, what they observed is that, that, that actually this, this alert, illusion, this trust, drives things for the positive. In fact, and this is going to drive you crazy, uh, you're, you're, here, here's the way they summarize their research. Watch this. <clears throat> In relationship, come up with the most generous explanation for others' behavior, and then just believe it. Can you say difficult? <laughs> But this is, this is the way they summarize 20 years of presumably PhD-level research on how do we explain couples who 20 years later are delightfully happy with one another's company. Now, I understand there's some major obje- objections, some huge obstacles to this. Let's come back to it in just a second. We are going to deal with those. But what if, and this is where I'm indebted to Andy Stanley uh, among others, what if part of what we can observe in relationship is that what we expect and what we experience forms a gap. And that those gaps, though, though they're often subconscious to us, though we're not often smooth enough to slow down and recognize that's what's happening, I'm not claiming to be good at this myself, but nonetheless, w- what if what we can observe is that what happens in relationship, whether we're talking about you driving down the street and someone pulling out in front of you, or you being at the grocery store and some checker being too slow, or you sitting next to somebody in class and they smell like B.O., or, or, or you having a coach that you think is kind of a jerk, or, or you being married to someone that you, you're kind of, kind of, I don't know, sideways right now, what, what if what happens in in relationship is gaps form. They put their dishes in the, in the sink again. An employee is perpetually five minutes late again. And what if how we fill in that gap drives the quality of the relationship? In fact, what if we could say it this way? What if when those gaps form, we really only have two options, <clears throat> trust or suspicion? We can assume the best. We can assume the worst. We can speculate in all kinds of negative ways. We can speculate in all kinds of positive ways. What what if that's what Paul's getting at when he says, love always trusts? Like it always trusts. It always trusts that they have some good explanation for why they're late. It always trusts. It it always protects. Protects it from what? Well, maybe protects it from, from a culture of suspicion and disdain and resentment. What if, what if what Paul is getting at here is a way of protecting a relationship? Now, there's obstacles. I totally get that. One of the obstacles, of course, we, we, all, we all get this. And by the way, I'm not claiming to be good at this. In fact, I was 21 years old uh, when someone loved me enough uh, to literally pound the table, look at me, and say, Adam, you have a critical spirit. I thought it was called vision. He told me it was criticalness or criticism. And to be honest with you, I did everything I could to survive the meeting. I went back to my office. I literally laid my head on my desk and just bawled. And I didn't have any understanding why. I got up from the meeting, and I spent the next week trying to convince all my closest friends that that person was a jerk and and that they really didn't know what they were talking about. And it took my wife looking at me about a weekend going, no, I kind of think he's on to something. (laughs) I'm not claiming to be good at this. This is as much a moment-by-moment battle for me as I'm guessing it is for, for many of you. But what if nonetheless it's true? And what if the reason love trusts, it's, it's, it's not a stupid thing. It's, it's not a like, well, therefore love has no boundaries and, and, and love is a complete pushover and, and love it has enabling problems and really love needs to go to Al-Anon. It's not that. It's that love understands that for the relationship to work and work well, it'll have to fight for a culture of filling in the blank with trust not with suspicion. You know, I I think you can see it in the posture of Jesus. It strikes me that he starts, in the Gospel of John, the whole conversation starts by Jesus. uh, John says this really disturbing thing. He says uh, he didn't trust himself to them because he understood what was in their hearts. So you can see that as actually an unwinding of this whole argument. Until you watch and follow the way he lives his life. Here, Here you had the perfect son of God, who says on the one hand, listen, I understand, people are messed up, they're broken, you're going to get hosed by them eventually. 
And what he lived out was a life of graciousness and trust. It's not that he never put up boundaries. It's not that he never called foul. But you'd be hard-pressed to make any kind of argument other than the argument that Jesus had a high view of people. He wasn't naive about what they were capable of. He, every hire he did, made or every conversation he had or every friendship he formed, he, he wasn't so naive as to think that people are perfect. But he operated from this place of trust. And then I, I jump into Jesus and I hear him saying things like, why do you worry? Like, look at the lilies of the field. Look at the birds. Seems like even he is inviting us into a relationship with him that fills in the blank with trust. That, that even on, on, the, on the vertical plane, if you will, we, we, we challenge ourselves not to explain everything, not to understand everything, but to trust, to step into trust. I was processing this week on a, on a video chat with, with John Goldingay, this awesome biblical scholar who is super approachable, and he allowed, us to, allowed me to Skype with him this week, and I asked him about the very situation unfolding in our community. You know, the murder and the tragedy of all that. And he said, Adam, the Bible's answer is Job. The Bible's answer is God doesn't always give us the answer, but he gives us enough information to know we can trust him. Not naive, I'm going to argue, honest, and yet arguing for a posture of trust. And there are obstacles. Of course there's obstacles. There's obstacles because what you experience from others provides an obstacle. And that gets tricky which is why I think what Andy Stanley says here is genius. Well, what he argues is when you find yourself finding it difficult to fill in the blank with trust, that's when you need to have a conversation. When you can no longer fill in the blank with trust when they're 10 minutes late or when they don't return your email or whatever, when you can't fill in the blank with trust anymore, that's when as a healthy adult you sit across the table and go, hey, listen, here's the deal. I really want to live from a posture of trust, but it's it's difficult right now. So I, I need to hear from you. Why do you keep putting your dishes in the sink? Or whatever it is for you, no matter how trivial or important it might be. It, it's, it's, it's not naive. It's just, it's arguing like, I'm going to protect this. And therefore, when I can't, I'm going to have a conversation. And if even still things don't change, then yeah, I might have to have some difficult conversations about boundaries and consequences and some of those different things. The other obstacle is you. Because you don't show up in a relationship as a blank slate. Neither do I. You have triggers, some of which you're clear on and others of which you're not, and therefore people do things that trigger stuff in you and you think the fault is theirs. What if we slow down and go like, wait, wait a minute, maybe the, maybe the problem's here. What, what, if, what if love fights for this trust? You know, I have a friend who uh, claims to have counseled more than a thousand different couples through adultery, through an affair. He, he, he says he has two observations, a thousand different couples he, he's walked through affairs with many of whom have survived, by the way. Two themes he points out. First one, he said, and this, this one just, uh, in over a thousand different affairs, he, he says he's only dealt with one that didn't involve drunkenness. I was like, seriously? And he says, uh, he says yep, people tend to keep their pants on when they're sober. <laughs> the other thing, uh, is he, he says, is nobody cheats on their spouse without killing them first. Now, he's not talking Bobbit or some literal homicide. His point is, uh, no, he still hasn't dealt with one yet, where the issue wasn't in their head, they were completely untrustworthy, completely unlikable, completely undesirable. We, we erode the value of the first person for long enough, and we can justify the behavior. What if, what if Paul's on to something? What if Paul goes, no, no, your relationships will thrive on such a higher level if you fight for trust? And we could ask this question, what's the alternative? I love the way Andy Stanley says it. Go to that next slide. He says, well, you can delight in uncovering mistakes, thrive on speculation, assume the worst, and embrace doubt. Sounds like an awesome way to live life, doesn't it? I mean, imagine you get the opportunity to counsel one of your sons or daughters or a friend or someone you mentor who, who's getting in a serious relationship, and they go, so how, how should I do this? And you go, well, here's what you do. You, you set a trap, you, you bait the trap, eventually they'll take the bait, and then snap, you've got them, and you can point out, see, I told you. I knew I couldn't trust you. No. What, what, if, what if part of the reason the New Testament speaks to the fact that that Jesus isn't just a self-help movement, that, that there's, there's this thing called grace that has to power us from within is because 
the reality is this is hard. That choosing on a moment-by-moment -moment decision uh, to live from a place of trust is, is difficult. And yet at the same time, beautiful and, and worth it. What if, what if the value of things like, we can go ahead and pull that slide down. What, what, if, what if the value of things like chair time, what if the value of that is, in some sense, it creates enough stillness, uh, enough solitude, enough silence, where, where you can communicate to God in advance goals like, Lord, I want to live with a high view of people and fill in the blank with trust, and no one's going to nail that right out of the gate. No one's going to nail it 100% of the time. But when you value starting your day with silence, solitude, stillness, it gives God the opportunity to go, hey, good job yesterday. You had a chance and you took it. And you create space for God to tap you on the shoulder and go, hey, uh, remember that whole exchange you had yesterday on that issue? I think the whole thing was you took the bait of filling in the trust, the, the gap with suspicion, and everything unraveled from there. What is the value of something like Sunday morning is the, the, the music and the prayer and all of this is to create some space because life moves at such a fast pace that we don't always have it. And we can set goals, but somehow we've got to have ways to check in on those and create space for God to, to give us tangible marks of victory and Areas where we need to repent. Well, what if God invites us not into a relationship of suspicion? Listen, I, 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 and this is what we're going to jump into next week, but it sure seems to me like a, a lot of the way our culture thinks about Jesus is that God so hated the world that he sent his son uh, to appease the wrath of an otherwise ticked off God. And now he has to love us. What if that's not the story at all? Well, what, what if... What if God knows full well what we're capable of in our brokenness and yet he wants to live in a relationship with us from this place of trust, not suspicion. He invites us to learn a life of dependence, not clarity and perfect outcome on everything. But what, if, what if on Easter Sunday, Jesus was in a sense fighting for God's reputation, that he's for us, not against us, that he's with us, that he'll take on any problem that can potentially sabotage and destroy what's otherwise available to us in the relationship. I'd like to pray, and Kate and the band will lead us through one more song. God, thanks, Lord, for, uh, thanks for guys like Paul and books like 1 Corinthians and the Bible as a whole and the historic church and God, that despite our best intentions to malign and misunderstand you, you give us ample opportunity uh, to step into a relationship of trust, not one of suspicion. Lord, I, I think probably everyone in this room would be willing to admit that what we're talking about today is something that we fail at more than we succeed at, and yet a battle worth fighting. And so, God, we just ask, I ask for your help, that you give us little tiny victories in our day, uh, give us some indications of growth that we'd that we'd form the kinds of relationships at home and at work that that are predicated upon trust, not suspicion, and that we'd have the the gumption, the guts, the courage to have conversations when when we're finding it difficult. We love you, Jesus. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online www.narratechurch.org We would love to hear from you.